A man without a vision will look to the past, and a man looking to the past won't have any future. And the Bible puts it this way, without a vision, people perish. But when you look at, when you look at what it says in the NIV, it's a little bit different. It says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Now here's a question. How do you get such a different translation there? Where there is no vision, people perish. Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. So let me kind of describe those two words, vision and revelation. Because vision is something that you and I see, right? I mean, God gives the vision in the form of revelation. So here's what God does. God is a revealing God. How many of you would agree with me that that, uh, you know, God has revealed himself to me. Let me see your hands. In fact, if God had not revealed himself to us, we wouldn't know anything about him. The reason that we know that God is love and that God is full of mercy and that God has grace. The reason that we know any of those things about God is because he first chose to reveal himself. And personally, I am very thankful that God is a revealing God and that I get to know Him. The very fact that you get to know Him and talk to Him and pray to Him is a result of the fact that He is a revealing God. But notice this, once God reveals Himself, then He gives us a vision. And that vision is of God's revelation. Now. Look at Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. You know, what I, what I really like about this passage right here is that what God is saying is this. Listen, when I reveal myself from heaven to you in the form of a vision, and I give you that vision, I want you to write it down. Uh, I want you to make sure that it's written down, that the runner can run with it, that people can understand it. And, and here's the really cool thing. God says, when I give you a vision... When I reveal myself to you, I'm going to make sure that that comes to pass, pass in your life. Now, I believe that's true, not just on a corporate level when we talk about church, but I believe that that's true on an individual basis. I believe that every one of us in here this morning should be praying, oh God, reveal yourself to me. Show me your will for my life. God, reveal yourself to my children, my spouse, my friends, my neighbors. Oh, God, reveal yourself to them. Give them a vision. And oh, Lord, make it come to pass. And God says, when we cry out to him, when we are looking at him and focused on him, he is going to make what he reveals from heaven to come true. That's the kind of God that we serve. So now we're, you know, we're looking at that from a church perspective. Listen, we are a small handful of people, but I want you to know that I believe the day is coming that God is going to turn what this place is right here into a movement that rocks the city of San Antonio, that reaches many people that are far away from God. I believe that God wants to do that. You say, how do you know that? I believe it because He's given me a revelation. He's given me a revelation in the form of a vision of the movement church. And here's what I want you to see. A lot of people, they wonder, they wonder, you know, what is, you know, what is up with the word movement? Uh, what, what is up with that? Well, there are several things that I want to share with you about that because one of the ways that we describe it is this that we are we are moving up we are moving in and we are moving out and i want to talk about the moving up first 
Uh, we are moving up in that we are loving God. Loving God. Lauren Walter told me, he said, you know, I just loved what we were doing in the home groups before we started meeting in here. And he said, you know, he said, I grew more in the last year than in the 30 years just being together in a small group, loving God, loving God. Let me ask you a question. Do you love him? Listen to what Jesus said. There was an expert in the law that came to Jesus. And now an expert is not just somebody that was piddling around with the law. An expert was somebody that the other attorneys and lawyers during that day went to uh, to give them advice about the Old Testament law. Well, this expert came to Jesus and he was really trying to test him, trying to stump him, embarrass him in front of all the people. And, and so he put this question to Jesus. He said, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So, so here's what Jesus is saying. He is saying, you know, I want you to move up. I want you to move up in relationship with my father. And I want you to love him with all of your heart. All of your soul, your heart, your emotions, all of your soul, your will, and, and all of your mind. So I want you to love God like that. I want you to understand that when you love God, that is the essence of worship. A true worship lifestyle is this, that you and I are presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Worship is not just all about music. Worship is loving God. Loving God. You might say, well, how do you love God? How do you love God? I tell him frequently. I say, in, in, in fact, let me tell you some things that I've begun to do just recently. When I get in the car and I'm driving around, uh, I've decided to keep the radio off, and and uh, and so I've got you know I don't have any kind of noise. I'm not making any phone calls. And I've just said to the Lord, Lord, when I'm driving around, this is a time that is completely devoted to you. I want to spend time hearing you and listening to your word. And and during those moments, I tell you what, they have become so rich where where we're just talking and I say, Lord, I love you. God, I love you. I thank you for the I thank you for the family that you've given me. I thank you for the for the wife that I have. I thank you for the home that I live in. I thank you for the church that you've called me to start. I thank you for the people that are attending. God, I just want to tell you on this day, driving around in my car, I love you. And I, I don't even know if I can put into words what that does for me. I mean, it's like, I want to go drive around more. Because God's just talking to me and sharing things with me. And, and another thing that I've been doing is I've been going around to businesses and, and homes, knocking on doors, passing out invite cards. I just say, Lord, this is going to be your time between you and me. As I'm not, you know, before I actually get to a door, I'll say, God, I don't know anything about those people in that house. But I just pray that you go with me, that your spirit goes before me and that you are working on that person in there. That so when so when I talk to them, Lord, uh, you will give me the words to say. See, loving God is a moment by moment, day by day activity. And I want you to understand, it is not inconsistent with anything else that you're doing in life. You can love God when you're doing the dishes. You can love God when you're vacuuming. You can love God when you're driving around. You can love God as an electrician. Hey, Jim, you can love God as you're ringing up the cash register. And, and serving people hamburgers. You can love God with all of your heart and soul and mind. Moment by moment and day by day. And I want you to understand. That is the essence of worship. And listen. 
When God so transforms our hearts to where we are overflowing with love, it's going to pour out into the city like never before. The love of God in and through you and me is the way that God wants to touch the world. And so when we talk about being part of a movement and a church that's, that's enacting a movement, we talk about moving up. But next, we also talk about moving in. And what's moving in? Well, moving in is this. Moving in is loving our neighbor. The next verse that Jesus gave, and I love this, after He said, you know, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind. Then He said, the second commandment is likened to it. The second one is this, that love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is anyone in need. Uh, your neighbor is someone who lives next door. Your neighbor is also someone who is very far away from God. You and I have some far away from God people. And what God wants us to do is He wants us to love them in the name of Jesus Christ. And how are we going to do that? Well, one of the ways I've already taught you, you can go up to people and you can say, you can say, listen, hey, Mark, if, if God could do a miracle in your life, what would that look like? You might say, it's fiesta. <laughs> And there are a lot of crazy people on buses. Oh, it's over now. That's uh, amen. Fiesta is over. You, you might say, you know, as, as, I'm, as I'm at my work, um, you know, Lord, give me an opportunity to ask someone the question, if God could do a miracle in your life, what would that look like? What would that look like? If God could do a miracle in old Westburgers, what would that look like? If God could do a miracle in your marriage, what would that look like? If God could do a miracle in your emotional life, what would that look like? If God would do a miracle in your life as a mom or a dad, what would that look like? Some of you young guys back there, if God could do a miracle in your school, what would that look like? You see, the reality is that there are a lot of people that need miracles. And we talked about that this last Sunday. And when you love someone enough to go up to them and say, you know what? I would like to pray for you. Tell me how I can pray for you. Tell me where a miracle needs to be done in your life. And then, you know, you, that, that's one of the easiest ways to enter in to somebody's life. And I believe that God has set us here for a very specific purpose. And what I want you to do is I want you to participate with me and I want you to pray with me as we go into these businesses all up and down the 1604 corridor, just asking these business leaders, how could, you know, if God did a miracle in your business, what would that look like? See, when we love, see, when we love God, that's called worship. When we love our neighbor, that's called ministry. And people need ministry. And the greatest commandment is that we would worship God by loving Him with all of our heart and soul and mind and that we would minister to other people by loving our neighbor as ourselves. So that's moving in. And then next, we're moving out. So we're moving up and that we're loving God. We're moving in that we're loving our neighbor, and then we're moving out and we're reaching our world. And I love this. The great commission that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. He put it this way. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. All nations. How many people does that include on the planet? When Jesus said, make disciples of all nations. Does anybody know the world population? 6.5 billion. It's like, yeah, over 7 billion. 
Over 7 billion people out there. And Jesus says, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And then he said, following that, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So what Jesus said is, I'm going to give you the power to do this. I want you to reach the entire world. So we're moving up in that we're loving God. We're moving in in that we're loving our neighbor. And we're moving out as we're reaching the world. And both of those, all three of those, moving up, in, and out, actually come from the great commandment that Jesus came and the great commission. And so here's, I mean, if you want to put it in a nutshell, somebody told me that only nuts live in shells. But if you want to put it in a nutshell, here it is. Uh, and repeat after me. A great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. Is there any other commandment that is greater than the great commandment? Or the greatest commandment? No. No. Is there any other commission greater than the great commission that Jesus gave? No. And so with that commandment and that commission, notice what Jesus said, teaching them to obey everything or all that I've commanded. And see, what is so different, what is so different here about what we're doing and what my experience has been in so many other churches is this. Let me, let me take a step back. You know, every one of us in this room are going to stand before God in heaven one day. And the Bible says that uh, we will receive our reward from Him. The Bible also says that uh, some of those things that we thought were good works are going to just kind of be burned up like wood, hay, and stubble because they were not done for the glory of God, but for the glory of man. But you know, when I stand before God on that final judgment day, uh, what I really, really want to hear Him say, and I think that you're in the same camp with me as this, I want to hear Him say, well done, Right? Amen. Well done, good and faithful servant. Now, when I stand before God in heaven, the last thing that I want to hear him say was, you know, what were you thinking? Why didn't you get it right? I want to hear him say, well done. And when I look at the Great Commission here and Jesus says that part of my responsibility is this teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And you know, here's, here's the difference. I want you to understand this. This is, this is very clear. The difference between the movement church and, and the majority of churches in America is this, that this is not geared just to be a learning environment. Most churches, what happens is you come in, you sit down, you sing, you listen, you go home, and then you come back the next week, you check the box, you do it all over again. What, what, what I believe that God has called us to do is to be involved in learning everything that He has commanded us and obeying that. And the obedience to what Christ has commanded is this. Oh, Lord, help us as a church love you and worship you like there is no tomorrow. God, I, I'm going to give you all my mind and all my heart and all my soul. All of it belongs to you. And God, help me genuinely love my neighbor as I love myself. And Lord, help me reach the world. Think of it this way. What if, let's say, pardon me, let's say, um, let's say you wanted to be a high explosives expert uh, as a career profession. 
And, uh, and let's say that I was a high explosive expert teacher and you came to me and said, you said, you know what, I would like to learn your trade. I would like for you to teach me how to do this because I want to, this is what I want to do for my career. And so I said, great, uh, here's what I can do for you. Come over to my house and we'll walk through all the books on high explosives. Uh, I'll teach you about detonation. I'll teach you about, you know, placement. I'll teach you about, you know, the amount of explosives that, that you use to blow up a certain amount of material. And then after I teach you sitting in my house, then I'll just kind of give you a bunch of explosives and let you go out there and try it out on your own. And uh, now, would you like that kind of training? Probably. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, teach me how to blow up things, but, but don't show me how to do it. No, listen, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to learn how to do high explosives, you're going to go with me. If you're my teacher, I'm not letting you off the hook. It's like, okay, and, I, and not only that, but I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say, how many of these things, how many things have you blown up successfully? Let me see your fingers, right? Uh, pull your shoes off. I want to see your toes as well. If, if, uh, if you're going to train me to blow up stuff, the first several times that we go out there to do it, you're going to be there with me and you're going to show me how to do it. Why? Because it is a skill that needs to be modeled and it needs to be taught. And uh, same thing is true in shop, right? I mean, here we have a high school shop teacher. You don't sit them down with a book on a bandsaw and say, read the book. Here's a piece of wood. You know, go make your mama a nice jewelry box out of it. Uh, while I go sit in the teacher's lounge and drink a Diet Coke. Yeah, you've got a, you've got a skill that you're going to transfer to them. And, uh, and because you want them to have all their fingers and toes. And hold your hands up. Yeah, don't show us your toes. All right, there you go. And so, and so I would let you teach me how to cut, cut pieces of wood. And, and like to make a jewelry box for my wife because you've got all your fingers and toes. I know that you can do that well. And, uh, and so how did, how, did Jesus, how did Jesus teach his disciples to obey all that he commanded? He spent three years with them, teaching them, teaching them everything that he knew. And then he went out and he showed them how to put it in practice. He said, he didn't say, hey, let me teach you and then I'm going to unleash you and then you're going to go out and do this. He said, I'm going to teach you, then I'm going to model it for you. I'm going to demonstrate it. Then I'm going to let you watch me and then you're going to go out and you're going to do it as I showed you how to do it. And see, when I stand before God, what he's going to ask me is he's going to say, James, shoot, did you disciple people like Jesus did? Did you do what he said, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you? And, I, you know, I don't want to get up there and say, well, I, I preached a lot of sermons. I gave them a lot of good information on how to do it. He's going to say, did you live it with them? Did you live it with them? Did you show them by example what it means and what it meant to obey Christ? And see, what's going to make this a movement is, is this, that if Jesus duplicates himself in me and I'm living the Christ-like life, Christ -like life and then I begin to duplicate my life into you. I train you as I've been trained. And then you go out and you train others as you have been trained. And those others train others. That's how a movement gets started. And so here's what it all comes down to. We have a revelation from God that he wants to use us to start a movement, right? And that has become our vision. So the question of heaven, and I believe the angels are looking over the portals of heaven right now, and, and, uh, and, and they're all going. They've heard the vision. Will they embrace it? 
Will they embrace what it means truly to be a movement? Will they move up? Will they love God with all of their heart and soul and mind? Will they move in? Will they actually go out and love their neighbors like they love themselves? Will they move out? Will they actually go out and try to reach the world? Will they take this vision that came as a revelation from heaven and move up and in and out? And I tell you this, that if we move up and in and out, we will change San Antonio for the glory of God and for the glory of Christ. Jesus took 12 people and changed the world. One man by the, the name of the, uh, of the Apostle Paul went out and just started telling people about Jesus and it changed the world. And the question is, man, I want to go and blow up some stuff. But I don't want to do it alone. I, I, want, I want to take you with me when I'm going out, knocking on doors, man, if you're somebody that would like to be trained in how to do that, I'll take you with me. All you have to do is say, hey, here's my email address. Let me know the times that you're going. Or when I'm going out to businesses, asking people the question, you know, if God could do a miracle in your life, what would that look like? I'd love to take you with me. And there are a lot of things that need to be done in order to get church set up here. Uh, you know, we need, we need a band. Uh, I've been talking to people. You could be praying that God would do a miracle in that life. Pray. Pray that God would do miracles in the movement. Pray. Turn your radio off in your car and pray that God would do miracles through us. I want to get everybody involved in a home group. Now, some of us were meeting on Sunday in my home and now we're meeting here. You'll be hearing some communication from me next week about opportunities where we can continue to meet because I don't believe that we need to lose that tight fellowship, that community where we're just loving on each other. Uh, and so I'm going to be sending out an email early this week about some opportunities where that can take place. Could we own this? Could, could we make this statement more than just words? But something that we truly believe. We believe in great commitment. If you didn't believe in great commitment, chances are you wouldn't have a business, you wouldn't have a job. You wouldn't be able to raise a family. And it's great to have a great commitment to things that you feel that you feel that are important. But listen, a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I want to I want to close by doing something a little bit different, but I want I want you to just measure the words great commitment for a moment. Great commitment. A man came to Jesus Christ and said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. In the King James, I think it says whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests to lay their heads in. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another person said, Lord, I'll follow you, but first let me go bury the dead. Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. You go preach the kingdom of God. Another person said, Lord, I'll follow you, but first let me go bid my family goodbye and Jesus, said, Jesus looked at him and said, he said, any man putting his hand to the plow looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. In another place, Jesus said, he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have no part of me. 
Jesus said in John chapter 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So the reality is this, when we measure what is required to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, it's nothing less than a great commitment. 